The iconic ghost town. A haunting reminder in the 21st century of that period in American history known as the Wild West. But what is a ghost town? Philip Varney is the greatest living authority on ghost towns. This definition is widely accepted. I say that a ghost town is a, a town that has two basic characteristics. One, its population is markedly lower than it was in its heyday. And secondly, that the reason for the existence of the town initially is no longer the reason why people are there. Kenneth Jessen is another expert on ghost towns. He sees that finding these relics of a bygone time should be on your must-do list. And I think the excitement is uh, getting there. The journey is often as exciting as the actual experience of walking around a place where people once lived and children once played and where there was commerce and sales and maybe even a few gunfights. But how did they come to be in the first place? As the United States population spread west from its original East Coast colonies to the Mississippi River, countless communities, towns, and cities sprang up. Some flourished. Others fell by the wayside and disappeared. last great westward push towards settling this vast country began after the American Civil War. It was a push into the Great Plains, into the rugged mountains of the west, and into the bleak landscapes of the desert southwest. It was the era of military forts to fend off Indian raids. of mining camps and towns where thousands hoped to strike it rich. Most of these places were short-lived. They experienced the boom and bust cycle of many mining towns and have been lost to the ravages of time. Others somehow hung on and survived as partial ghost towns. Towns where people still live, such as Silver Plume, Colorado. Towns that have become tourist attractions, including Virginia City, Montana, Bodie, California. And then there are ghost towns like Tombstone, Arizona. Towns where the past comes alive through reenactments. blacksmith shops to the fabled shootouts of the Wild West. Other old mining towns are flourishing today because of the introduction of gambling. Towns like Blackhawk and Cripple Creek, Colorado. And the infamous Deadwood, South Dakota, where legendary lawman Wild Bill Hickok met his fate. Real ghost towns and abandoned forts are those precious remains of the past that exist today only as shadows of former glories and wicked events. Events that linger at times like haunting ghosts. But why even care about these remnants of time gone by? Why do people go to ghost towns? I'm gonna to refer to a friend of mine, alas, who has died, Tony Hillerman, who wrote a preface for my, first, my second book. And in it, he said this, to me, to many of my friends, to scores of thousands of Americans, these ghost towns offer a sort of touching place with the past. We stand in their dust and try to project our imagination backward into what they were long ago. Now and then, if the mood and the light and the weather 
are exactly right, we almost succeed. In this program, we're going to visit the mining ghost towns of the Rocky Mountains. The Rocky Mountains, extending from northern New Mexico into Canada, form one of the great mountain ranges of the world. Craggy peaks, rough terrain, and hostile weather made them virtually uninhabitable. And for more than two decades at the opening of the 19th century, they were considered to be nothing more than a formidable barrier between the eastern United States and the west coast. What people didn't know was that hidden deep within them were fabulous riches in minerals, including gold and silver. The first Americans to enter the Rockies were the intrepid mountain men who trapped beaver and bravely explored the region. In addition to roaming through the mountains in search of animal pelts, they found a way through the mountains an area in present-day Wyoming where the mountains disappear. This area, known as the South Pass, allowed for thousands of pioneer families beginning in the 1840s to gather their worldly goods and head west along the Oregon Trail. When gold was discovered in the Sierra Nevada mountains in 1848, Thousands more flocked along the 2,200-mile-long trail to California in search of riches along the western edge of the mountain range, initiating the first gold rush. Not long after, more gold was discovered in the mountains of Colorado, Wyoming, Idaho, and Montana, sparking many gold rushes bringing thousands of prospectors and miners to explore every mountain and canyon. In doing so, they created the Rocky Mountains' first major industry, mining. The Idaho gold rush alone produced more gold than the California and Alaska gold rushes combined. The legacy of these mining operations thousands of boom to bust towns, many leaving behind a variety of buildings, abandoned mines, old cemeteries, and curiously, some of the most beautiful settings in the world. The life of a mining town has a well-known cycle of boom to bust a cycle of great wealth to abject poverty. A cycle of vast hope to dismal despair. It is a cycle repeated up and down the Rocky Mountains, from the first strikes in Colorado in the 1850s to the gold strikes in Montana during the Civil War, and the last big gold rush in the Black Hills of South Dakota in 1874. And because these mining towns were isolated from the rest of the world, there was nothing to keep them going once the mother load ran dry. The cycle begins with the discovery of placer gold, gold that has weathered out of its rock matrix, gold that has worked its way into streams in the form of nuggets and gold dust. This gold is recovered by sluicing and panning like what we were doing along the North Fork of Colorado's Clear Creek. Once the word gets out, men flock to the region. In addition to panning for the placer gold, prospectors begin looking for the source of the gold. This is what happened with each gold discovery in the Rockies. Each brought in thousands, all looking to strike it rich quickly. As the men flocked to the gold field, 
tent cities spring up. Thousands of tents spread up and down the gullies and stream beds, each holding as many as a dozen miners and their equipment. A rough order of justice prevails as the men look out for one another against claim jumpers and bandits. Makeshift saloons spring up too. Here, miners spend their gold on whiskey, card games, loose women of the evening. The occasional con man might find the foolish miner who loses his claim in a scam. Then, as in the case of Colorado's Black Hawk in Central City, a mother load is discovered. Placer panning gives way to mining underground, the rich gold veins of ore locked in the hard rock of the mountains. This is followed by milling operations that begin separating the gold from the matrix. If the gold vein is a good one, then the city grows with the wealth pouring out of the mines. Soon, the tent city is replaced by a regular town of wooden and brick buildings, homes, hotels, saloons, mercantile exchanges, a boardwalk, perhaps a school and a church, and of course, a jail. And as long as the ore lasts, as long as the strike continues to give up its gold and silver, the town prospers. Such was the case with Black Hawk and Central City. The Central City Black Hawk area, the richest square mile on earth, uh, gold mining uh, was the dominant. Of course, you get a little bit of silver with that. And uh, they have a celebration in the streets of Central City, uh, Madam Bunch Days, and they bring up some sand from Clear Creek for people to practice panning. I have never failed not to get gold in my pan. There's that much gold left in the Central City area. It is truly a, 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 a worth a fortune. It's just too expensive to, um, to extract the gold. So, eventually, the mines become exhausted. The steady stream of gold and silver trickles to a stop. The boom is over, and the bust is beginning. The big mining company closes its doors, and the miners leave. Others try to hang on, but the lifeblood of the town has drained away. And eventually, the townspeople abandon their homes. A few may hang on until the bitter end, but when they die, the bust is complete. All that is left is an empty town, a mining ghost town of the Wild West. Indeed, by 1950, the population of Central City fell to a few hundred souls. Black Hawk was a shadow of its former glory. It's heyday long gone. But then, gambling came to the towns, and a new boom was underway. Black Hawk is a real interesting case because uh, when the casinos came in, you had all of these people bemoaning uh, what they felt was the destruction of a um, classical uh, mining town. But actually, I date back to when there were no casinos there. I'm, I've been here nearly 50 years. And there were only a couple of buildings left from the mining era uh, in terms of homes uh, because Black Hawk was a mill town. And the mills were torn down uh, for scrap metal uh, during uh, World War II. So the working class town became a gambling paradise. However, there was a different fate for Central City. Central City is an entirely different case because that was where people lived. People worked in Black Hawk, people lived in Central City. So it was the, you might say, the suburb uh, uh, in, in some, some respect. And a lot of work has been done by the Gilpin County Historical Society to preserve Central City. 
and uh, they have a lot of preservation efforts going on. And certainly, yeah, there's been a few new casino buildings that are made to look old, things like that, but they're sitting for the most part on vacant lots. And so much of what was uh, existed before gambling is still there today. As far as the homes, if you start walking up to High Street and you uh, visit some of those beautiful Victorian homes, they've been meticulously restored. The downtown area, the original buildings are all still there, uh, dating back to uh, the end of the mining era. So Central City's done an outstanding job of historic preservation, at least in my opinion. Central City also has one of the finest collections of historic cemeteries. Cripple Creek and Victor are another pair of twin boom towns in Colorado's Rocky Mountains. Both towns boomed as the surrounding Cripple Creek Mining District quickly became the most productive gold mining district in the United States. Mining is still part of the economy more than a hundred years after its founding in 1891. Nicknamed the City of Gold Mines, Victor, a semi-ghost town, is one of the best preserved mining camps in Colorado. And today, it remains one of the showcases of the mining era in Colorado. Victor, Colorado is one of my favorite ghost towns because it might be the best city ghost town I can name. What I mean by that is it is not a rural place at all. It has multi-story buildings in it, it has brick, it has uh, concrete, it has uh, paved streets. It was a town of great riches. I like it because first of all it is in marked contrast to its sister city which is Cripple Creek. They were both gold discoveries that came at an absolutely terrific time for the state of Colorado. It was right after the silver crash of 1893, which knocked out places like Leadville, Silverton, and others. And miners were just left devastated because the price of silver it just absolutely plummeted. And gold was then found in Cripple Creek and the surrounding area. And great cities were built, both Cripple Creek and Victor. I like the old saying that Cripple Creek gets the glory, but Victor gets the gold. Cripple Creek was always bigger than Victor. It was always the main town. It was always the one that everybody heard about. But Victor did always have the gold. All of the biggest mines were always in Victor. And the most ore was always brought out of Victor. Even though Cripple Creek did well too, Victor did better. At once upon a time, those two cities, just located five miles apart, had some 50,000 people living in those two places. Amazing for way back in the 1890s. When the Woods Brothers, who were the undisputed founders of Victor, went to build the Victor Hotel, which was badly needed at the time. As they were digging the foundation, what did they find? Gold. There was gold to be found everywhere in Victor. So they found a new lot to build the hotel on, and they put right there in the middle of downtown a gold mine which produced millions and millions of dollars over the next several years. Victor is the poor stepchild, and I find it absolutely charming. It has a wonderful firehouse and city hall. It has a, a bank building that is now a terrific uh, hotel with an operating old elevator. It has the Lowell Thomas Museum 
which has lots of artifacts from somebody that I vaguely knew and people younger than I don't even know at all, but he was a major citizen of, of uh, Victor and was a radio star uh, in the 1940s, I would say, 1940s and 50s. Victor is one of the most haunted of the mining ghost towns, and the Lowell Thomas Museum is one of the most haunted places in Victor. Ralph was part of a ghost hunter's team that investigated the old museum. This is the Lil' Thomas room. Uh, his, a lot of the stuff that's in here is both uh, his father's and Lil' Thomas's itself. The, uh, when we were in here last, just as we were preparing to leave, we decided to come in here and do an EVP session. We had lined up all of our sensors here because they didn't really want us on the rocks here. We, though we didn't get any photographic or video evidence, every question, time we asked a question, we either had an EMF spike or a temperature shift. The uh, questions that gave us positive responses were not about little Thomas, but actually about his father, which is really unexpected. But, uh, it was a fun experience because all of a sudden we had gone from a very quiet couple of hours to coming in here and asking questions about the city of Victor and what he did here and the types of patients that he may have had, and if this was actually used as a med medical facility at any point. And then we'll go out to the hallway here. So when we came in here, we have a very awesome picture of all these dolls. And in one of those pictures, I have one of my investigators in this room. He's just behind the rocking horse, and the room was laid out a little differently. And you can actually see a change where everything around this one spot is almost crystal clear for a night photo and then there looks like something that's actually either sitting on or standing in front of the rocking horse, a small child. In addition, Victor also has a wonderful cemetery associated with it. In 1991, gambling came to Cripple Creek and once more Victor became the poor stepchild of these twin mining cities. Yet, Victor remains the true jewel of Rocky Mountain ghost towns. St. Elmo, Colorado, tucked away in the Rocky Mountains, is hard to get to, but well worth the effort. Originally named Forest City, this haunted ghost town is one of the best preserved relics of America's infamous gold rush period of the late 1800s. Founded in 1880, nearly 2,000 people settled in this town during its heyday, mining for gold and silver. After the ore ran out 40 years later, the railroad left two years after that, and then the people followed. After that, the town's survival depended largely on the presence of the Stark family, who remained the sole year-round occupants of the town through most of the early 20th century. Originally, Anton Stark, a rich cattleman, and his wife Anna took up residence in St. Elmo. Stark became a section boss for one of the local mines. He and Anna ran a general store in the Home Comfort Hotel, located on Poplar Street, St. Elmo's main business area. The general store also became the post office and the telegraph office. The Starks had three children, Tony, Roy, and Annabelle. All three grew up and worked in the town. In time, after buying up many of the buildings, they were the last residents. According to the legend of St. Elmo, one of them, Annabelle Stark, still watches over the town today, many years after her death. Annabelle is said in legend to continue to protect her town in death as she did in life. When she was alive, she was known to stand in front of her buildings with a shotgun and run people off if she didn't know them, that was her property, 
her town and her buildings and she would threaten to shoot you. There are people today that say that she still appears at night holding that gun. Other people have said that they have seen her in a window in one of, the, one of their old buildings upstairs also holding a gun. I had no experience like that. I can tell you that the majority owner in the town disagrees. Today, one of the most intact, privately owned boom towns, St. Elmo consists of over 40 antique structures, a dirt road and boardwalk, two churches, and numerous minor cabins. Its setting is one of the most beautiful in the entire West to enjoy. Mining towns like St. Elmo were basically founded on the edge of nowhere. Their only resource, the value of the mineral wealth in gold and silver in the hills surrounding them. When that mineral wealth vanished, the reason for the town's existence vanished with it. The mining towns became ghosts, and in many cases all but disappeared. However, eventually the powers that be in the Rocky Mountain states recognized that these towns were treasures and set about preserving some of them for everyone to experience. One of the best is South Pass City in central Wyoming. One thing that I find very uh, interesting about South Pass is that uh, the Wyoming the state of Wyoming actually purchased the town as a 75th anniversary present for the state. And today it's maintained and uh, provides some wonderful summer uh, tourist uh, activities, including many walking tours um, where you can still see many of uh, the original buildings. 30,000 artifacts from the original town still remain. Uh, so I think. You know, as far as a, a ghost town being preserved, Wyoming has done a wonderful job with South Pass. South Pass City is one of the few ghost towns in the Rocky Mountain region that is actually on the plains. First established as a stage station on the Oregon Trail along the South Pass, it's ironic that many of the travelers heading west to the gold fields of California could have gone no further because under their feet was gold. In 1867, the discovery of the Carissa Lode and hundreds of other promising gold strikes turned the area into a booming mining district. People by the thousands poured in, with South Pass City forming the population core. In fact, it was the second city to be incorporated in the state of Wyoming. Then, 20 years later, the boom was over. Today, South Pass City gives the ghost town hunter the best chance to experience what a mining boom town was like. It is a town that offers every possible perspective. from picturesque overviews from the surrounding hills that give the lay of the town, to scenes of Main Street, to close-up views of buildings, to the stream that supplies precious water, to the historic Wolverine Mine just north of the town. Though this mine was never a big producer, it provides an experience of the darkened, close atmosphere of the typical gold mine. Nearby, one can get a close-up look at a stamp mill, a huge machine that crushed the gold-bearing rock in preparation for processing. Off in the distance, one can see the famous Carissa Mine and Mill, it was the main employer during a sequence of gold mining booms and busts 
from 1868 to the early 1950s. The head frame rises to a height of 57 feet. The ore was hoisted from the mine on one-ton ore cars, then loaded on the trestle and pushed by hand across the 400-foot span to be processed in the mill house. At the end of the day, the workers returned to South Pass City to eat, drink, play, and sleep. It has several buildings, including the, the Carissa Saloon, so named for the mine that was, it's still up the hill. And incidentally, I don't think it's open yet, but the Carissa Mine will be open for tours eventually, and it, and it might be op open by the time you are seeing this. But in the town itself, there are hotels, saloons, lots of memorabilia. Memorabilia now on display in many of the town's buildings goods from everyday houses, the trappings of a typical western boomtown saloon, and perhaps most interesting, old rooms completely furnished. South Pass City also has a unique place in American history. The history of South Pass intrigues me the most because William Bright, who was a member of the first territorial legislature of Wyoming, uh, introduced a bill for women's suffrage. Uh, so Wyoming then became the first state to allow women to vote. And it wasn't three months after that that another South Pass resident would become the first woman elected to office as Justice of the Peace. That person was Esther Hobart Morris, and her holding of political office set the stage for women's suffrage in the U.S. with the passage of the 19th Amendment in 1920. South Pass Mining District includes a number of mines and a few other mining boom towns. There are three in a row, South Pass City, Atlantic City, and Miner's Delight. Atlantic City has a nice church and a couple of good buildings in it, but it's populated. Miner's Delight is northeast of Atlantic City, and it is completely unpopulated, and that's it, so it's a true ghost. And its, mod, it's, it's buildings are modest. There are maybe four, and they are just log cabins and small, small structures. But you have to walk to them, and I've, I've had to walk around herds of cattle to get to it. And once there, you are in a pristine ghost town of very small size. Gold was discovered here in 1868. The mine was located about a quarter mile west of the town. Boom and bust periods followed the operation of the mine. In March 1882, the mine was completely shut down and not used again until after the turn of the 20th century. The two brief boom periods, 1907 and 1910, were in relation to mining operations. Eventually, everybody left. We were eager to see this true ghost. The trailhead is marked by an old miner's cemetery. From there, the trail leads to a gate, which opens but must remain chained. From there, the trail winds through an aspen pine forest. After a fairly long walk, suddenly the first building looms ahead. A beautiful structure perched above a peaceful beaver pond. It couldn't have been more idyllic. From there, a path led to a sequence of buildings. We entered one of them and saw the remains of former inhabitants. There is not a more isolated and beautiful ghost town in the whole West.
After the Fuhrer of Colorado gold died down, the Rocky Mountain gold rush moved north to Montana, where once again, the Rocky Mountain's rugged peaks rose up from the plains. It didn't take long for the first pan to turn up some placer gold. In July 1862, a group of prospectors from Colorado who called themselves the Pikes Peakers were doing a little prospecting in Montana in what was uh, what they called Grasshopper Creek because of the sheer numbers of grasshoppers that were there at the time. And they found gold, just like all of the other, many other mining rushes. It didn't take long for word to get around. The gold that they found was 99.5% pure with some of the richest gold that's ever been found in the United States. So it brought the people running. Within just a couple of months, there were 400, about 400 prospectors working the hills around what would become Bannock. The mining town was named for the Bannock Indians and is located in southwestern Montana near the town of Dillon. At its peak, Bannock had 10,000 inhabitants, three hotels, three bakeries, three blacksmith shops, two stables, two meat markets, a grocery store, a restaurant, a brewery, a billiard hall, four saloons, and a Masonic lodge. After this glorious start, it took nearly a hundred years for Bannock to go from boom town to ghost town. That long period of mining activity has given Bannock a wonderful sense of permanence. The ghost towns of Montana are particularly good and I want to give kudos to the state because they have protected the best ghost towns in Montana and they're well worth protecting. First and foremost is Bannock. Bannock was the first real town in Montana and it would have been very easy to have lost this town to looters because a lot of the buildings were well made and it's been protected. And a nice thing about it and another one of the great ghost towns that I'll talk about in a minute in Montana is you have to leave your car behind. So when you walk into Bannock, you are walking in, you are walking away from the 21st century and back into the 19th. As you enter this western time capsule, one of the first things you notice is that Bannock is one long main street with buildings on both sides. Buildings such as the Turner House and the Assay Office. Like most buildings in a boom town, they saw many different uses over the years. The Turner House was a residence, post office, and barber shop. The assay office was also a stage station and a butcher shop. There's something else to notice about the buildings of Bannock. What happens with any ghost town or any mining camp is that the first people who are, so who are there are building uh, I'm just putting up tent cities. Prospects seem good enough, people start building wooden buildings. Well, the real sign of, of, of prosperity is when they start building brick buildings, because naturally that means they intend to stay for a long time. And Bannock has excellent examples of all of those. There are just old log cabins, there are board and batten homes, and there is what was the courthouse and is now the Hotel Mead, which is an absolutely wonderful building. Built in 1875, the county courthouse was supposed to serve as the legal and political center of the region. But it fell on hard times when the railroad missed Bannock. In 1881, only six years after its completion, the residents of the county voted to shift the territorial legislature to Dillon. 
For 10 years, the building remained empty until Dr. John Singleton purchased it and turned it into the center of social activity of Bannock. Finally closing in 1940. It is also one of the most haunted buildings in Bannock. A park ranger told me an amazing story about a, a little girl. There is a story of she, her father was working across the creek and uh, she was, she had, the, the standard thing for her to do was to take lunch to her father. And one time she went and the creek was running fast and she uh, drowned. She was buried in her favorite dress. And as I recall, it's a red dress. And uh, I was being told this by a park ranger, a, a woman who said, I have never gone on up to the second floor of this Mead Hotel because there was a Japanese tourist who came, who went upstairs and came down and said, why is a little girl in a red dress up there? And she said, she just shuddered because of course, she saw no possible way that this gentleman could know about this story of a ghost of the little girl who died, who drowned. She said, I'm not ever going up there. Across the street from the hotel is the other grand building of Bannock. There is also a terrific combination Masonic Lodge and Schoolhouse. The Masons offered to build in Bannock a meeting house, as obviously they do, but they offered to have the first floor to be a schoolhouse. In the West, lots of lodge buildings are on this. The meeting place is on the second floor, and usually below it is a commercial enterprise. In this particular place, it's the only place I know of like this, it was a schoolhouse and you can go into the schoolhouse and you can look into through a plastic second story. You go up a second story and you can look through a plastic window thing and you can see the appurtenances of the Masonic order up there as well. Bannock is one of those places that lets the visitor walk through the buildings to experience the town's history from the inside out. Remember, the doors may be shut, but they are not locked. Enter. Enjoy. And see if you can feel those ghosts of the past. There is only one church in Bannock. Simple Methodist Church. Curiously, it was built in 1877 in response to an Indian threat in the region. When a preacher traveling through town convinced the residents they needed a place of God for safety. A year after the discovery of gold at Bannock, New riches were found at places that would become inextricably bound with Bannock. The gold boom towns of Virginia City and Nevada City. Virginia City was a sister city to Bannock. They're not close by, but they were the only two towns of any size at all in the uh, territory of Montana. And both had gold deposits and both had vigilanteism and law and order problems and Indian attacks and just you know, the, the things that happen in these towns. And Virginia City had the same kind of boom and bust cycle that Bannock did and at about the same time lasted a little longer than Bannock. And next door to Virginia City was a sister city to it of much smaller called Nevada City. When Virginia City declined and Nevada City was essentially non-existent. In 1944, a married couple, Charles and Sue Bovey, who had considerable wealth, 
did a favor for the state of Montana, historians and ghost town lovers everywhere, by deciding to purchase and renovate Virginia City. And so they bought for pennies on the dollar compared to what it would be worth now, old buildings, but they spent a fortune rehabilitating these buildings. And then they did a second thing that was even better, is my opinion. They owned the land of, of what is now Nevada City, but there was essentially very little on it. They then started buying up terrific buildings all across the state of Montana and trucking them to uh, Nevada City and built a kind of western town. But they are not phony buildings. And so there are there would be a house from one town, a assay office from another, a school school from another. And to purists, so there's a there's a problem here. You know, purists say we want those buildings in their pristine situation back where they originally were. That's a pipe dream. Because unfortunately, if those buildings sit out there unprotected, there will be people who will knock them down, burn them, take them, take doors home to with the eye sort of random feeling they might use it for something in their house. So they made sure that didn't happen by having these all these buildings move to Nevada City. And now Virginia City is the Virginia City is the authentic big time town. Like Banning, it's got two-story banks and fancy saloons and all of that. Nevada City is the poorer cousin, more representative of the real western towns of the West because they have, it has wood buildings from log cabins to board and batten to rather elegant homes. There is one home there that is just like a two-story small mansion. And the Bovies also collected memorabilia. And so there are hundreds and thousands of pieces of things. One of my favorite, there is a museum there that is filled with musical instruments of, of all kinds. And it, it's just a wonderful place. To learn about the history of these twin boom towns, we boarded a replica of a stagecoach and local historian Bill Bromley gave us a guided tour. All right, now our first stop is going to be right here at this white building on the left side, whoa. This was the original courthouse here in Virginia City. Uh, the courthouse that you see up on Wallace Street was uh, built to be the state capital. Virginia City had high hopes at one time of becoming the state capital, but we never did because after a number of years, um, there was another gold strike up at what they call Last Chance Gulch and uh, as the population migrated that way and we came into statehood, most of the people were living there, so it was actually Helena that became the state capital. But this was uh, a territorial capital for a short period of time. Now, this building was also used as a hospital for a short period of time. It was run by the charity Care Nuns. And the people that live in Virginia City today say that a young person must have died in this building because at night they can see the ghost of a young woman floating across the windows late at night. As we moved along, we could see that the building was not a two-story structure at all. It has what is typical of many ghost town buildings, a false front. Residents could send pictures back east saying they were living in a two-story home. We continued our tour. Now, as we make this turn, if you look out towards the railroad trussels, there are a few old buildings left there, but that, that was actually Virginia City's Chinatown. The Chinese came into town uh, primarily to do the laundry for the town folks, but they were pretty well discriminated against back, uh, against back then. There was actually a city ordinance stating that the Chinese could not set foot on the streets of Virginia City. We traveled along the old stage route between Virginia City and Bannock. Along the way, we passed old miners' cabins. 
It was also along this route that the stage carrying gold was often robbed. Our destination today was to visit the site where a group of miners from Bannock discovered gold along Alder Creek in Alder Gulch. And being the miners that they were, they took out their gold pans. They got out of the creek, and what they discovered would later become known as the largest placer gold strike in the world. Sounds like a pretty brave statement, doesn't it, for this little gully? We'll tell you a little bit more about that story later on. Passing old mining tailings, we arrived at the discovery site. Now we're gonna stop here for a few moments because if you look at the monument off to the left, this was the actual spot where gold was discovered. And you may not be able to see or read what it says there, but I'll tell you about it. It says that on May 26th of 1863, gold was discovered on this very spot. And of course, Bill Fairweather and his party all their names are listed there. It also goes on to tell you that over a course of time, there was over $100 million worth of gold taken out of Alder Creek and Alder Gulch area. If you equate that to today's dollars, gold is closing, I think, at about $1,400. So you can do the math. That means it'd be worth about seven to eight billion, billion with a B, dollars today. We turned around and headed back to Virginia City. I do want to point out, uh, as one of our last attractions, this brick building on the right. This was the original livery stable here in Virginia City. So when people came to town, they would park their carriages out here. The horses got to go inside to be uh, fed and watered. Today, it's the home of the Virginia City players, and people go in there today. Most of Main Street, uh, there are a few original buildings. Uh, a lot of them, some of them, not a lot of them, but some of them had been bought in, but some of them are also original. The town was really deteriorating at one time, but then they got into a restoration effort. But our old Wells Fargo office, as my understanding, was an original building. The original Essayer's office here was an original building. The three Montana boom towns, Bannock, Virginia City, and Nevada City, are united in one of the Wild West's greatest outlaw stories and legends. Enough, Jaeger. It is the story of the Montana vigilantes. A story of vigilantes, ordinary citizens who took the law into their own hands during the Civil War. A story that is reenacted every year in Nevada City. The story revolves around Bannock's sheriff, Henry Plummer, and his men. Red, I understand you wrote a letter to Alec Carter allowing him to evade the Vigilance Committee. Is that correct? I, I didn't write a letter. I delivered a letter. Did you letter. carry that letter? I delivered Get him ready, boy. Get him get a letter. As the vigilante reenactors begin rounding up Plummer's posse, ghost town historian Kathy Weiser Alexander tells the infamous story that began nearly 150 years ago with robberies and deaths along that stagecoach route between Bannock and Virginia City. In 1863, more than 100 men were murdered. That's how bad the law lawlessness in the area had become. There were all kinds of rumors about who were the road agents. This was obviously a gang. This is obviously a very organized gang and somebody who seemed to know what was going on, when the shipments were taking place, when they were leaving, what was going to be in those shipments because voila, it was always the big ones that seemed to be targeted. I want you to go inside. You need to write a letter. You make your peace with your maker. Rumors started to circulate that perhaps those in the know, maybe law enforcement itself might be behind this. But nothing was done of it at that time. Henry Plummer was also made a United States deputy in August 1863. 
putting him even more in the know. Could he be behind this group, this gang, which were called the Innocents? And I'm going to vote first. Walk over with me. The people of Bannock and Virginia City had finally had enough. And they formed, in December of that year, what was called the Montana Vigilantes. The Montana Vigilantes would not only operate in Bannock and Virginia City, but would operate across the state for several years, taking care of justice in their own way, often brutally. Captain Williams, it's murder! In the next several weeks alone, 24 men were hanged by those vigilantes in just two weeks. One of the last of those 24 was a man by the name of Red Jaeger, Erastus, nickname Red Jaeger. Let me go with you. Put me in chains and let me go with you while you, you catch the rest of them and hang them. I'd like to see them all hanged for putting me in this position. Step to the back of the stool, Red. You know you've got it coming. Like other men who are getting ready to face their deaths. He, you know, he began to beg, he'd give up anything, he'd give up any kind of information. And he pointed the finger at who? None other than Sheriff Henry Plummer. On June 10th, 1864, Henry Plummer shared the fate of his posse at the gallows. Our final ghost town in Montana is Comet, a ghost town far from Montana's gold fields, a ghost town whose primary ore was silver. Comet is a town in danger. I have a wonderful photograph in my Mountain West book of its mill in a kind of foggy morning light. Well, that wasn't fog, it was smoke. This is in an area where there have been lots of forest fires and I worry about Comet every time I see a picture of it because it's wooden. The entire town, which is made up of lots of miners' shacks and a big mill and a two-story uh, boarding house and a general store, uh, all are terribly vulnerable. And I, I really am concerned when I was there and smelling smoke, there was this kind of ominous feeling that I had, even though the light was eerily beautiful. I was aware that I might be in a town I'd never see again. On our way to Comet, wondering if there would be anything left for us to find, we stumbled upon an unexpected gem. Basin, Montana a town near Comet that briefly was a hub of gold and silver mining. Basin's population peaked at about 1,500 in the first decade of the 20th century. It gradually declined as the mines played out. Today, it is something of an artist colony and well worth visiting for the abandoned mining equipment and vehicles and for its easily accessible picturesque mine portal. On the west end of the town sit the remains of the Glass Brothers 1903 smelter. One ancient stack still reaches skyward while its brother lies collapsed nearby. But the ghosts of Comet still beckon. We drove the four and a half miles on High Ore Road. Then, in front of us, appeared the ghost town's first building. Comet was still there. We proceeded through the rugged old roads of this once booming mining town. My first impression of Comet, as far as the supernatural, was that there may be something there. And maybe that's because of the buildings being in such decay kind of gives you that extra feel of a ghostliness. You know it's not going to be there much longer and maybe that the spirits are crying out, uh, save our town. 
the hotel especially and around around the hotel kind of felt a, a heaviness in the air. I'd have to say a place like Comet, Montana would rate as one of my favorites too because it is so intact and with one resident and that's just a caretaker. You know, um, it's like the people just walked away. There's still furniture in those houses, you know? And being able to walk in those buildings and really see what it was like when there's still furniture there and there's still, it's, it, it gets my imagination running. You know, why did, why didn't they just walk away? Where'd they go? What were these people like? Well, this was a nice house. Why would they just leave? Why did they leave their stove? Why did they leave their bed? In 1876, the town was platted and surveyed. It consisted of 12 blocks laid along three east-west streets and three north-south streets. One year later, the Comet Post Office opened. The Comet mine was barely profitable through the rest of the decade and narrowly weathered the silver panic and depression of 1893. The mine was sold several times in the early 1900s. Although most precious metals had been mined out by then, the mine continued to produce valuable lead, zinc, and iron. During these prosperous years, Comet boasted more saloons, 22, than the school had children, 20. In 1926, the Basin Montana Tunnel Company took over the mine and built a 200-ton flotation mill ore concentrator. At the time, the mill was called the most modern in Montana. Mining continued at Comet through the Great Depression, employing about 50 men, and was considered the largest mining venture in Montana outside of Butte. However, after World War II, the mine closed forever, and the town became a ghost. Today, the best structures are the residences on the hill. A fabulous mill and two-story dormitory, a haunted two-story boarding house, and one other unusual building. It does have a sort of unofficial caretaker, and I'm glad. There is in this town one, like a, a double wide mobile home and I knew he was watching me the whole time. And I'm grateful for that, because I mean no harm and I'm only taking pictures. But if I had taken out something like an ax or something, he'd have been there in a big hurry. But it's a, it's a, a absolutely, it's vulnerable, but it's beautiful. Rising out of the plains of western South Dakota, South Dakota's Black Hills are an inviting sight. And they are also the home to the last gold rush of the Rocky Mountains. Indeed, the last gold rush in the lower 48 states of the Union. In 1874, prospectors discovered gold along the streams of the Black Hills, and by 1876, the last lawless frontier was the mining boom town of Deadwood. You have people coming in who are there for no good. They're there for the excitement to gamble, to steal, to rob. Uh, you have a predominantly young population, uh, young men. Some women come, but generally those are, are prostitutes that then are there to make their own money. And the whole town's in an upheaval. Traditionally, uh, 
these settlements, uh, like the Black Hills, the early gold rush settlements, are prior to law enforcement. Black Hills, of course, was settled prior to any legal authority. The federal government had no authority. Nobody had authority. So the miners held sway. 1876 was also the year that two of the Wild West's most memorable events occurred. The Battle of the Little Bighorn, also known as Custer's Last Stand, and the gunning down of Wild Bill Hickok in a Deadwood, South Dakota saloon a few weeks later. Wild Bill, the West's most celebrated lawman, had fallen on hard times and was now unable to live the bigger-than-life reputation created for him by the Eastern press. With his stunning six-foot-three frame and long curly hair, he could go nowhere without being noticed. For a time, he joined his friend Buffalo Bill Cody's Wild West show. But in the end, Hickok was drawn back to the lawless frontier, where he felt most comfortable. And it was here at the gaming tables that he could satisfy the need that became his Achilles heel, his addiction to gambling. In the spring of 1876, he married Agnes Lake Thatcher. Um, she had been a patron of Wild Bill's. And uh, again, Wild Bill was really down on his luck. He really wasn't making an income to support his lifestyle and um, probably um, married um, this woman who was well off. She ran a circus. And um, then he, um, after they married in Cheyenne, then he took her back to Cincinnati, Ohio. He told her that he was going to head to the Black Hills to stake a claim and um, to produce a living. So he heads back west, uh, picks up in Cheyenne his good friend Charlie Utter, and they head to the Black Hills. On the way, they stop at Fort Laramie, and the Army has uh, been pretty fed up with Calamity Jane, who had been drunk for days there, and they asked Charlie Utter and Wild Bill if she could accompany them on the wagon train. Um, they arrived in Deadwood around mid-July of 1876, and Wild Bill did go and prospect um, in the creek beds a little bit, but he spent most of his time playing poker, um, gambling um, in the establishments in, in Deadwood. So um, he was here less than a month when on August the 1st he went into the number 10 saloon and uh, gets involved in a poker game with Bill Sutherland, who was also called Jack McCall. Now he was successful in beating Jack McCall. Um, the next day, around noon, Wild Bill uh, returns to the number 10 saloon and sits down. Uh, legend has it that Wild Bill um, always liked to sit with his back to the wall. Well, in the number 10 saloon, um, the front door would have been facing him, but the back door would have been behind him. Um, he asked Charlie Rich if he would switch chairs with him, and Charlie Rich, um, who was one of the other gamblers, declined. So um, they were engaged in playing a hand of cards, and um, Jack McCall comes in through the back door, and while Bill doesn't notice him. Um, at that time, um, Captain Massey had just beat Wild Bill's hand. Captain Massey had four sevens, and Wild Bill had a king full house. And uh, Wild Bill asked Sam Young, the bartender, to get him $15 more of chips. And at that same time, Wild Bill said to Captain Massey, you old duffer, you beat me on the hand. And then bang. Jack McCall shoots him in the back of the head, and Wild Bill drops dead. So, at the age of 39, the greatest icon of the Old West was dead. The greatest gunfighter, the one who killed more men than any other lawman, the loner, the kind and compassionate man of justice, was dead. 
Today, Deadwood has become a gambling mecca for tourists. The number 10 saloon, where Wild Bill Hickok was shot, now finds its name on the other side of the street. The original number 10 saloon burned down in the tragic fire of 1879. The spot is now occupied by the Wild West Casino. It can be said the mining towns of the Rocky Mountain West were created to fail. Doomed to the cycle of boom and bust. If you want to look at it from a percentage standpoint, if you go back to the Denver Public Library and you start looking through the photographs of these ghost towns and you start counting buildings, you realize that probably only one or two percent of the buildings still remain today. So obviously during the last century, we've lost about 98 percent of the structures in these ghost towns. There is but one way to experience this glorious time in American history. And that way is to explore the remnants. The ghosts of the souls that built these aesthetically haunting and beautiful towns before they vanish from the western frontier. Here they are in their faded glory.